Welcome to the Playmakers Podcast. In today's episode, we're going into the NFL. We talking everything East. AFC East in New England, NFC East with the Super Bowl champ for the Duffy Eagles reside. Can anybody catch them too? We'll dive into it. But we also be going to the college ranks. We'll be talking about the ACC. Can nobody stop Clemson? Me and Dallas look at things differently. See who we pick coming out of the ACC. Don't forget, we're talking the Big Ten, too. What's going on with Ohio State and Urban Myers? Does this change our pick? And will somebody else come out on top in the Big Ten? We'll get into all of that. But we got some breaking news that we're going to talk about first. And it's the NBA. Stay tuned. Let's go. Podcast. We're back again. I'm your host, I know the Playmaker Silence. I got my co-host, Dallas Glenn. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good and great. Lucky. Lucky. Well, on today's show, we're going to talk about the Patriots and that division. We'll get into the NFC East as well. We'll talk about the football with the ACC and the Big Ten. But real quickly, I want to shift gears to the NBA. NBA just released the Christmas Day schedules, and it's pretty stacked. You ready for this, Dallas? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm ready. The Philadelphia 76ers at the Boston Celtics. The Milwaukee Bucks mm-hmm. at the New York Knicks. Okay. The Los Angeles Lakers with LeBron James going to Oracle Arena. To take on the rainy defending NBA champion, Golden State Warriors. Yeah. Oklahoma yeah. City Thunder without Carmelo Anthony versus Houston with potentially Carmelo Anthony. True. And then running they're running it out, the Portland Trailblazers at the Utah Jazz. Which game are you looking for? What are you looking forward to? Oh, no, you first. Oh, me first? I'm looking at OKC, yeah. Houston. Carmelo Anthony was in OKC last year. He's he's rejected to sign with the Houston Rockets this season. I want to see how both teams look. Without one piece yeah, and crazy. the other team with the piece. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Christmas. It's weird. The Christmas, Christmas games, they're, they're early enough to kind of sort of get a feel of how everything will go. But, I mean, it's also enough games to see, basically make predictions. But I know it sounds kind of like both sides of the fence, but I'm saying all that to say, like, you know, I'm interested to see what Portland and Utah do. I want to see, like, which time slot their game gets. I want to see how close the game is. I want to see if one team can run away from the other. So I, I just want, I want to see all of those factors because, you know, those two teams are probably going to round out the playoff picture. And I just want to see if, like, you know, one of them is capable of an upset. Because the West, as deep as the West has been, this might be the first year in a while that it's truly top-heavy. I mean, Golden State, Houston, if LeBron can do the LeBron effect again, Los Angeles. The basic thing is to beat the, the whole Warriors squad. James Harden, Chris Paul, and Carmelo Anthony for LeBron. All three of those pads, that's like... I, I want to see if they got heart. I want to see if they have the heart. And I always set it up to see them maybe make some noise in the playoffs. And then also, um, our boy from Duke. His name escaped me, but he's on the Jazz this year. Okay. He was looking real good in summer league. Grayson Allen. Grayson yeah, Allen. He, he was looking real good in summer league. What do you think of the Eastside Conference and my final rematch? Sixers and Celtics. Man, at this point, I don't even know. It's like the same game plan. I mean, the thing, that game went to seven. That series went to seven games. And two of the best players weren't even on the court. 
that's what trips me out, you know. No, the series went to five games. It did. It went right. to five games. Trippy, trippy, tripping, 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 Who knows? The Celtics with Kyrie Irving going to Hayward back up. You know, Philly got that bad taste in their mouth from last season. Mm. Joel Embiid's the real focus. We will see. It's going to be good. But, hey, go to the Playmakers with a Z at the end, blog.blogspot.com. Let us know. Which Christmas Day games you're looking forward to see? You heard it from me. I'm looking at OKC Houston. Dallas is looking at Trailblazers and Jazz. Now let's shift yep. gears to what today's episode is supposed to be about. And unlike last week, we're going to start in the NFL. And we're going to look at the AFC East. As everybody already know, it. that's the New England Patriots division. Really nobody else talking about anybody else. But New England Patriots in that division. But just on the side, Dallas, what do you think about Buffalo drafting a rookie quarterback and Josh Allen and the New York Jets drafting Sam Donald from USC? Well, I mean, we can look at the Jets track record with drafting quarterbacks. You know, it hasn't been good. It's been quite terrible, actually, between Geno Smith, Christian Hackenberg, and Bryce Petty. I mean, them putting their eggs in a rookie quarterback basket when they got Teddy Bridgewater and some other people to compete. I mean, they can have fun with that. Because the weird thing about the Jets is they can have five quarterbacks on the roster and they still can't do anything on offense but run and look very ugly. So you can write them off because it doesn't matter how much defense you play. If you can't score the points against the England, you don't have a shot. Buffalo, I, I'm still not understanding why they were so eager and quick to get rid of Tyrod Taylor. I mean, yeah, he had the performance that he did against Jacksonville, but people have to actually sit and look at that game. The Buffalo Bills have never really been known to air the ball out. In fact, he will, what else the game he? The Buffalo Bills have never been known to leave cleats on people's jerseys. They've never been known to run the ball. They've never been known to pass the ball. Buffalo has always been known for ball control. They're not really great at anything except for keeping the ball away from you and keeping the game close. If anybody, as you know, we have a lot of bandwagon Jaguars fans this year, but if anybody watched that playoff game, it would see that, you know, Tyrod didn't necessarily lose them the game. He just didn't win it. You also have to remember that the Buffalo Bills had one of the longest playoff droughts ever. We're not even going to go to the whole, well, at the time they had to, no, 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 ever. They were up there. It, it was dry. The fans should have been grateful that they even made it. And I just don't get how in the same game you put Nathan Peterman in, he throws a pick. It's like it's almost as if like the whole regular season didn't teach you that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. So now that they have Josh Allen who didn't do anything at Wyoming on the boat, and Nathan Peterman, I'm going to write them off because their defense has aged out. And they can't even keep up with New England. That just leaves the Dolphins. Ryan Turner here is back for the Dolphins. They did mm-hmm. add one of the Patriots receivers in Danny Amadola. But they did lose a move. They did lose a Dada K. So Los Angeles Rams. Mm-hmm. 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 Can, can the Dolphins compete? Well, I mean... I'm going to just be real. They're the only ones that have a shot. Veteran quarterback who people have their opinions, but I'm going to tell you right now, 
Ryan Tannehill, I would take him over 15 starting quarterbacks right now. And I would take him over just about half of the league. If Blake Bortles got hurt, like done, I would take Ryan Tannehill over a lot of people. So, I mean, you know, that's the only veteran quarterback in the division besides Tom Brady. And they got a receiver for him. Danny Amendola, say what you will about his durability issue. When he's on the field, he's a factor. He's had games against the Jets in the past. He had a great game against Jacksonville last year in the AFC Championship game. When he's healthy, Danny Amendola can surprisingly play. The tricky thing is, can he really be a number one option? That's where it's going to be rough. As a slot receiver of his durability, getting all the reps and all the targets, he's not going to make it to the playoffs if they do make it to the playoffs. I mean, you know, when I think of the Dolphins, I just think if they can finish second, and I know that if they can finish second, because Buffalo did make the playoffs last year, if Miami can finish second and not by, like, you know, New England just runs away with it, like New England's 13-3 and three and everybody else is done, it, no. If they can finish within two games in New England, no matter if they make the wild card or not, I think Miami is definitely going to be on an uptick. It's just really hard for me to pick this year. My, Tom Brady's healthy, looking like he has an age a year. New England is making consistent wide right receiver moves. They're trying to find the best weapons possible for this man. They're making the wide right receiver moves every week. Oh, not to mention they just added Eric Decker to the roster. That's what I'm saying. I mean, they're they're trying to capitalize on whatever time Tom has left. When they traded Jimmy Garoppolo that last year, that was them buying in. Whether it's one year, two years, three years, they're all in. Whatever Tom Brady needs, they're going to get it, and they're going to get it ASAP. Uh, let me chime in here, you know. Uh, I'm going to come back to Buffalo later. Uh, Ryan Tannehill is back. He's healthy, supposedly. But you don't have Travis Lindsay. You traded him to Cleveland for whatever reason. You know, I'm not going to get into that. You bring in Amendola, you still got Devontae Parker. You don't have a Jai. You traded him to Philly, who in a win in a Super Bowl. So I don't know. I don't know the direction Miami's going. I just don't know. I need to see what direction Miami's going. Honestly, mm-hmm. the Jets. They drafted Sam down the third overall. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you pretty much saying this is his team. This is he's the franchise guy. Mm-hmm. The question is, do you have the talent around him? I like Robbie Anderson. He had a great season last year, mm-hmm. but can he duplicate it again? Ugh. Can he be consistent? Cowboys, uh, Cowboys is a good coach, but when are you gonna start showing progress? It's the How many years have you been now? Like four, about four years, three, four years. That's more than enough time to get something going. So when are you gonna start showing progress in the Jets? Now it brings me to Buffalo. You trade it away to Rod Taylor. You drafted Josh Allen. You brought in A.J. McCarron from Cincinnati. Okay. You still got Shady McCoy. Okay. Well, well, well. You made a You made a playoff last year. You played a hard-nosed, tough, old-style football game against the Jags. Okay. Mm-hmm. Question. Do we believe in Calvin Benjamin? Oh, no. I don't. Do you? I don't know. And he didn't help himself when he said the remark that he said about Cam Newton. I mean, I don't, coming off of, you know, you, you made the playoff last year just like Cam Newton. You lost early. 
just like Cam Newton. Instead of worrying about Cam Newton and feeling sour, be happy that A, you were a part of that magical run that Buffalo had, and B, understand that you're in a division where you got Tom Brady and the Patriots. This ain't the NFC South where, and we're not talking about the NFC South, this ain't the NFC South where anybody literally has the chance to win a division every year, where three teams can make the playoffs every year. Dude, you're in the NFC East. Why are you even worried about Cam right now? Oh, by the way, I'm going to play this in right now. Next week, tune in. So we be going to the Dirty South. We talking South next week. Stay tuned for that. Dirty, dirty. Dirty, dirty. That includes all Southern conferences, right? Pretty much. But anyway, back to Kevin Benjamin. <laughs> you came in with problems. Uh-huh. You came in overweight. You came in out in shape. You have a history of injuries. The best year Carolina's had since Steve Smith been gone. You weren't even there because you were out injured. Cam Newton gets MVP and, and guys the team to the Super Bowl. Eventually, they lose to Peyton Manning. And the Denver Broncos allow Peyton Manning to ride off in the sunset. That's a different story. Yeah, there's no know. shame in losing the Super Bowl to Peyton Manning, by the way. No shame. No matter how bad he played that game. But the best year Carolina's had, you was injured. Yep. And you want to sit here and say, ain't none of this that happened to Carolina was your own fault? None of it. Mind you, his rookie year, he had 1,001 yards. He, he had 1,000 yards, but 1,001 yards. So it ain't like he blew out the league and was a superstar his rookie year before he got hurt. Yeah, Cam Newton is not the best accurate throwing quarterback in the league. Yeah, we get all that. But guess what? He came to play. Every week, Cam Newton provided his best. And for you to mm-hmm. sit there and call him out, that's just, I don't like that. Lame. It's not good on your on your, on your part. So, anyway. Super lame. We both say New England is going to win this division by default. We don't believe in nothing. Three teams are going to challenge. So, we're just going to leave it there. New England will repeat as the AOC East champions until Tom Brady retires. Essentially, like, that's, that's, a, that's a shoot, brother. I mean, that's. I don't see any, because like we just said before we move on, Cowboys has been there for like four years. They haven't moved the needle an inch. Buffalo just, they, they traded Cordy Glenn, traded Marcel Darius, traded Sammy Watkins, got rid of Tyron Taylor. They're making moves backwards. They're, they're intentionally making moves backwards. And you can say salary cap, age, whatever have you. The Jaguars, immediately got better. Marcel Darius immediately put that team over the hump when it came to run defense. Um, Cordy Glenn, I don't know where he is. He's definitely going to help somebody in his offensive line. He's one of the best tackles in the league. Sammy Watkins, he's been bouncing around, but if you make a top 10 list of receivers, if Sammy Watkins ain't 9 or 10, I'm going to wonder what your criteria is. So I just, I don't know, man. And then Tyrod, Tyrod and Baker Mayfield, that, that's a 300% quarterback increase for the Cleveland Browns. They got two dudes who can start day one and at least get to the five way. So I don't know what Buffalo is doing. It's just New England is the only team in that division that seems to think long term. So, I mean, I better hope Tom Brady gets hurt. I'm wrong, though. We're going to shift gears. gears. Yeah. And we're going to go and to the we... NFC East. The home of the Super Bowl oh, champion, Philadelphia Eagles. Carnell, what am I want to talk about this? Don't nobody. In the NFL preseason, when everybody has a chance, when everybody has the same shot to win the Super Bowl, except for the Cleveland Browns, I want to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles. Darnell, do you know who we all want to talk about? 
Let me guess, America's team. How about them Cowboys? Them distracted, patriotic, God-fearing Cowboys. Dak Prescott, who has thrown one touchdown, if my reports have been correct, one touchdown the entire preseason in practice. How about them? Let's talk Cowboys. Dak Prescott is... It's a quarterback as Zika area has no opposite issues to worry about, so he's not getting suspended. <laughs> Man. They had Adam Hearns from the Jets with the Jaguars. They traded for Tavon Austin during the draft. During this past mm-hmm. draft. Mm-hmm. Des Bryant is no longer there. Jason Wayne has retired and is working for ESPN on on the Monday night crew. Big loss. Underrated loss. And then Jerry Jones came in line and said, uh, nobody on the Cowboys will be protesting for that national. Best GM in the NFL. That Prescott said what he said about the about the national anthem. Dallas, you to get up, you huh? Dallas, the floor is yours. I give you the Dallas Cowboys. Ah. It's weird, man, you know. Offensive line, they're trying to bounce back this year. Dak Prescott is weird. I don't really know if it's bouncing back for him because I think that Ezekiel Elliott really, really, really was the offensive like leader of that team. I think the Dallas Cowboys have built themselves to be the old school football team of the NFL. Like, there's the Cowboys, there's the Ravens, there's the Seahawks, and there's the Jaguars. Those are the teams where it's smash mouth, it's defense, the offense. I mean, a quarterback might be taking a snap, but hey, you know, it's, it's physical. I think the Cowboys with Ezekiel Elliott for all 16 games should be one of the best teams in the NFC. I think Dak Prescott was exposed last year where he needs an elite running back behind him. You know, but at the same time, let's really look at the old school NFL. Hall of Fame quarterbacks weren't throwing numbers like they're throwing now. And some would say, well, that's a sign of the times, Dallas. And I say, you're right. Dak Prescott would probably be a Hall of Fame quarterback in the 60s or 50s. But it's 2018. When they put nine in the box, because Dak Prescott's only thrown for 95 yards in a pick. What are the Cowboys supposed to do with that? It seems like every year, Darnell, every year something happens to where the Cowboys on paper should be bouncing back and having that year. And it's always something. 82% of the time it involves Jerry Jones. This year is one of those years. And the other 18%, there's something on the field where it's just like, you almost see it in training camp. Oh, that's not good. Cowboy secondary, historically, oh, that's not good. Uh, the linebacker's getting hurt left and right. Oh, that's not good. Team defensive linemen getting suspended. Oh, that's not good. If you are receiver, you will go with me for a minute. If I can't channel my Stephen A. Smith. Well, we'll go on. We'll go on. The matter mm-hmm. is, the Dallas Cowboys mm-hmm. are an accident waiting to happen. You can book it. That, that 18% is a dangerous 18%. Because <laughs> what will go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's just... It, well, I can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, and as can you. But, you know, we could just basically tell Jerry Jones being Jerry Jones and Dak Prescott being worried about the wrong thing is what's going to lead to the Dallas Cowboys demise. The Philadelphia Eagles are just too powerful. The New York Giants, Eli Manning, OBJ, they just, I can't imagine them just laying down this season. And Washington is supposed to have some kind of franchise quarterback now. The firepower is just too much for the Dallas Cowboys defense to do what they usually do. And Dak Prescott, 
I don't see that press got thrown for four thousand dollars this year. I, wow, Big prediction. I don't see him throwing for four thousand yards this year. And the unfortunate thing about that is, if he ain't throwing the rock up, they ain't keeping up with a lot of these games, and they on division, much less New Orleans, Los Angeles, Atlanta. Their cousin is supposed to be a bona fide franchise quarterback instead of Case Keenum. He's there. Maybe they got a real quarterback in Minnesota. Now, you look at the NFC. The NFC is a quarterback hell. Quarterbacks everywhere. At least two franchise quarterbacks in every division. So, I mean, how about him, Darnell? Uh, you, how about them? I'll come back to the Cowboys. We'll come back to the Cowboys. But let's look at Washington. Alex Smith is there. Jordan Reed's there. Can he stay healthy? Jameson Crowder, mm. a nice receiver. They dropped the days. Case I don't see where running back. Mm-hmm. They went in seven and nine last year. I'm looking at their schedule right here. Let me hit, hit get them out to you. They open up at Arizona. Okay. They open at home games against the Indianapolis Colts. Okay. Green Bay. Goes there. Mm. They have a bye week in week four. Mm-hmm. They go to Drew Brees. They're on to mm-hmm. Carolina and Dallas. They go to New York mm-hmm. to play the Giants. Home to the Falcons mm-hmm. at Temple. Mm-hmm. Home mm-hmm. to the Houston at Dallas at Philly. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I think at Dallas, I think that's the Thanksgiving week. So, I think that's Dallas and Washington on Thanksgiving. Interesting. After they go to Philly, they home to the Giants. They go to Jacksonville. They go to Tennessee, and they finish off with Philly. The schedule I just gave you. Over or under seven games. <sighs> I say eight and eight. I say over. You say over. Yeah. Okay. Here, here, here's, here's my reasoning. Here's my reason. I am of the belief that having one player is better than having 21 players. What I mean is, in the NFL, once you have a franchise quarterback, you immediately have a chance in every single game you play. So when we think about the Washington Redskins and their schedule, I mean, because I'm pulling it up myself, I mean, it just, I think of Alex Smith. I think of what he was able to do in Kansas City. People forget. Let me just remind y'all real quick. Alex Smith was taking the Kansas City Chiefs to the playoffs when he didn't have a wide receiver to throw a touchdown to. The man was literally thinking and dunking the entire season, made the playoffs. And if I remember correctly, I think that was the year, I may be wrong, that was the year they lost to Pittsburgh, basically because of a holding penalty. I might be wrong. That might have been Jerry Macklin's first season. I know the year before wasn't like they got blown out. In fact, that might have been the year where they blown up, where they blew out Houston at Houston in the first round when Brian Hoyer was throwing up six like it was Christmas Day or something. So, when I look at the rest of the Redskins, Alex Smith doesn't need a deep threat. You know, Alex Smith doesn't even need a number one receiver. You can put number three receivers out there have Reed with him and give him a running back. Alex Smith doesn't like to throw the ball deep. Alex Smith is the greatest game manager of all time. He will not lose you the game. Alex Smith is not going to lose. That game in Jacksonville, we're going to win, but it's going to be by like three. Alex Smith is going to do just enough. Alex Smith is going to throw the check down. He's going to throw the tight end flat. He's going to throw. He's going to do good in the red zone. He's going to do what he has to do 
to keep that game close. And that defense is going to do what they have to do to make sure Alex has a chance. Alex Smith is just one of those players where he keeps your defense off the field. He keeps everybody healthy because he spreads the ball around because he's not going to throw it too deep. And he doesn't like to force balls in the coverage. As soon as that one wide receiver starts getting double, Alex Smith is going to go to a different target. He's, he's going to keep the Washington Redskins in so many games this year. They can beat Indy. They can beat Arizona. Um, they can catch New York flipping. They can catch Dallas flipping. They can catch Tampa Bay. They can catch Houston. Um, shoot. If you think about keeping the ball away from Marcus Mariota and Derrick Henry, he might be able to get something in Tennessee. He might be able to pull that up. I just, I think they have a chance. To not suck. But the thing is, though, Alex Smith is going to keep them in game. I just don't know if the rest of that team is there yet. Losing by five is still losing. Losing by a field goal in the last second is still losing. Losing in the last two minutes of overtime, uh, seven to two, is still losing. So, I mean, I give him eight. I give him eight. It's 500. It ain't like it's nothing extravagant and miraculous. It's 500. I think they can go 500. I've seen more teams go 500. Interesting. Interesting. You said what do you think? Yeah, I'm playing 500. What about you? Over or under? Looking at the schedule. Thinking about these things. Either they go seven and nine again, or they go nine and seven. Wait, they're going down now. So what I'm saying is, they can repeat last year. Or they do better by two. Dude, no, Maybe. how are you going to ask the question over or under and not pick one? I'm getting it though. What I'm saying is, yeah, they can catch the Colts. Yeah, they can slip with Dallas. They can slip with the Giants. They could get Tennessee. They could get Tampa Bay. Can they get one from Philly? And between Green Bay, New Orleans, and Jacksonville, can they steal one of those? You know what's the crazy thing about that? They play Philly late in the year. Philly is either going to be the defending Super Bowl champs or they're going to be having a Super Bowl hangover. Playing Philly the first time in Week 13, ooh, that's a tough pick. That's a tough pick because basically – Philadelphia's going to be in wild form. Either Carson Wentz will take his job back and be lighting it up, or Nick Foles is going to be dominant. I don't, I don't think they get Philly. I think they get swept by Philly. It's too late in the season. Maybe week one or week two. Maybe when everybody's working the kinks out. But nah, man, that's going to be full force Philly by then. Uh uh-uh. oh. You think they're going to catch one? Remember, that last game of the season is against Philly. I mean, the rest of the starters, yeah. So, I'm saying they go 9-7. and seven. They split in their division. And somebody's getting caught between Green Bay, New Orleans, and Jacksonville. Somebody's getting caught. And I'm going to throw Atlanta in there, too. I think that Jacksonville and Green Bay, those are the ones that are most likely to get caught. Because I don't think Atlanta and New Orleans are going to, like, they play in the same conference. I don't think that they'll be caught slipping. I think Green Bay, because Green Bay, if, it's, if Aaron Rodgers is up to, if he isn't playing a thousand percent, anybody can play a close game with Green Bay. In Jacksonville, Late in the season, last season might happen. They either might get too confident 
and get caught slipping or who knows. Because Week 15, the way that NFL.com and ESPN, a lot of them are doing, uh, Week 15, Philly, New England, Jacksonville, uh, Minnesota, they should be looking to rest people at that point. So it's probably going to be Jacksonville or Green Bay. I, I think those are the two teams that might get catch. They might get slipping. Okay, throw another plug in there. Next week, we're talking Jaguars. I think I'm going to shock some people with what I got to say about the Jaguars. You probably won't. But hey, let's get to the team I'm looking forward to challenge the Eagles the most. You see, the New York Football Giants. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. They went 3 and 13 last year. It was a terrible year for the Giants. I'm looking for the Giants to bounce back. Eli Manning is healthy. Or the Beckham is in training camp healthy. They drafted arguably the best talent in the draft in Saquon Barkley. True. They added Alice Oakley to the defense along with Colin Bonner in the linebacker core. Uh huh. Oh. I'm looking at the Giants. You challenge the Eagles. So by challenge, do you mean hang with them in the beginning of the year and Philly pulls away, or if Philly finishes twelve and four, New York finishes eleven and five? Before I get to that, let's let's, let's look at this. They open up at home to Jacksonville. Ugh. They go to Dallas for a night game. They go to Houston the week after. Home to New Orleans. Mm-hmm. At Carolina, yeah. on the Philly, yeah. at Atlanta, on the Washington by week, a week nine, the second half, at San Fran, on the Tampa, at Philly, Chicago at home, at Washington, on the Tennessee, at the Colts, and finish it off with Dallas. So we both know they're going to win more than three games. So we ain't going to do the over and under three games with them. Which one? First, okay, let's get the first three out of the way. Because, I mean, when you have a running back to compliment that one, they have their one. Eli Manning, say what you will about him. His regular season are always rocky. But if New York Giants find a way to sneak into the playoffs, everybody needs to be on red alert. He's just one of them quarterbacks where if he gets into the playoffs, it's a wrap. That being said, I mean, it's the regular season. Let's think about it. That's tough. Because you're going to have to Quan Barkley versus Leonard Fournette. That in itself, I mean, I give the edge to Leonard because he's proven. I, Saquon isn't about to be a scrub. Like he, That game is about to be ridiculous. That might be one of the highest scoring games of the season with more than 400 total rushing yards. That, that's going to be one of those games. Even when you do that, even when you do that, that's what I have. I think they call it the, look, man, I, I believe in the kids. Now, I think in the NFL, you can't, we can't put not in the box and get Eli back. I, I, OBJ is good. I don't even know who the second receiver is. Full disclosure. AJ Boyer is probably going to lock him up. But it's just one of those things where it's like it's Eli Manning. Even though Eli has been having a really, really, really bad stretch the past couple of years, until he retires, I don't I don't see any reason to disrespect him like that. They just opened up the game with it in the box. I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you. AJ Boyer might show sure. him. Who? Because you're going to have Ramsey on over there. And you're going to put Boyer on Sterling Shepard. AJ Boyer was like the number one rated corner by pro football focus. AJ Boyer. Don't. Under, Jalen Rams, like, listen, don't underestimate Sterling Shepard. Are you just saying that for argument's sake, or do you really think A.J. Boyer can't handle Sterling Shepard? No, what I'm saying is, don't think A.J. Boyer is just going to shut down that other side. Oh, 
Eagle hasn't paid for it. Sterling Shepard is a receiver. <laughs> and never, oh, and never oh, mentioned. Oh, oh, oh. Well, well, AJ Boyer is a cornerback. I mean, what, what is, what, what's Sterling Shepard done to, to do work like that against a top five NFL corner? What? You mean to tell me you're just going to go ahead and give Jalen Ramsey the matchup with OBJ, but see AJ Boyer going to struggle against Sterling Shepard? I'm saying Ramsey going to struggle. I'm saying Ramsey going to struggle. And not to mention, they do have a tight end. Evan an Ingram. Who? So, Eli got weapons. I respect Eli, but I don't respect his weapons except for OBJ and Saquon Barkley. I'm guessing you're going to have to learn on week one then. You like the only one that I know that doesn't respect Eli's weapons. I respect Eli. I respect Sterling Shepard. I respect OBJ. Trust me. Don't, don't sleep on the Giants. Don't, don't sleep on the Giants. They got weapons. Well, I hope Giants fans listen to this episode because you might be the only one hyping them up like this this year. After that game, we're going to revisit that game. We're going to bookmark that one. When that week comes, it's the first one. It's the first one. You put Mark and that going. Jesus, it's the first one. Okay, what? Now, the other game I'm looking at, New Orleans. Many Mm. Mm. Breeze. Barkley versus Kamara. And that, would, that would be the last game of Mark Ingram's suspension. We'll be looking into that next week. Second year versus first year. Uh, here's the weird thing about the trend with NFL running backs. NFL running backs aren't truly proven until their third year. Because I think the sophomore slump is running backs the hardest out of like every like offensive position. I think it is the sophomore club hits them harder than they even do quarterbacks. So it's going to be interesting with Kamara because, you know, we can't, we can't overstate how important it was to have that one-two punch in New Orleans last year. And it's only four games. Okay, we'll talk about New Orleans next week. But, you know, it's four games. And they still have the, the rookie of the year. I mean, come on. They got Drew Reed, but they don't have a shot. But, I mean, Oh no. I, once again. That's tricky. You look at Jacksonville and New Orleans, that's tricky. We can go to the following week. We can go to the following week. At Carolina. At Carolina. Oh god. I mean I'm ugh. Ugh. I mean, it's, it's football, man. It's, it's, it's a preseason. It's a preseason. Until we see actual that, until we see game to game that where we can, like, do, if we're going off of last year's team, just having minor changes, and if everybody just maintained where they were last year. Oh. I'm, I'm, I'm giving the guys nine to ten wins. Giving the guys, I uh, just couldn't run running back. It's the it's the Giants. I don't believe the Giants will have two back to back terrible seasons. Hold on, let's go through with the field real quick. Let me just feel like, hold on, with you. Oh, I feel. I know how to. Oh, when is it? 
Oh. What what bad can I say? What is a bad thing I can say about the Philadelphia Eagles? Not one. Uh, all the key players are coming back. Yeah, they got a hell of a schedule. I give them that. <laughs> they not they the NFL is not making it hard for them to repeat. But I got Philly going three and thirteen again. You mean thirteen and three? They gonna repeat three and thirteen again. They might go twelve and four. That's at the least. Yeah, I mean the three games the man. NFL is the offensive league. With this with this headroom, how do you, how is anybody gonna stop uh Philadelphia? There's three games I'm looking at on Philly's schedule. Jacksonville and London, week eight. Okay. At New Orleans, week 11. At Los mm-hmm. Angeles Rams, week 15. Mm-hmm. Now, the first game that might can happen is probably Dallas or the Giants catching them on a bad week. Well, I mean, if they're, they're going to have 10 wins each, uh, week 17, they're going to have to catch a game off to it. Unless one of them just turns into a juggernaut this year. Like I said, the way Dak Prescott's been looking in camp and everything, and the way Dak Prescott, Dak Prescott looked last year, you're basically saying Ezekiel Elliott's going to get ran into the ground. And that's just not sustainable. So it has to be New York, really, because New York has a quarterback. So we already saying 10 wins in the NFC gets you a chance at the playoffs. Yeah. Good ones in the AFC because, I mean, we, we've already talked about the AFC North. We basically wrote off everybody but one team. This, this, this week, we didn't wrote off everybody but one team. Now you're going to look at the South and the West. I mean, somebody's got to get the last two spots. But yeah, double digits in the AFC get you The AFC is weak. So in the yeah, NFC, I mean, in the NFC, to be considered a playoff team or be or have a shot to get in the playoffs in the NFC, you have to have at least ten wins. At least ten. It's too many teams. Nine wins is not going to cut it. No, uh, uh-uh. because somehow, some way, Green Bay, New Orleans, um, I want to say Charlotte, Carolina. Atlanta, like the regular suspects, the usual suspects, even mm-hmm. Seattle, they'll find a way to get nine wins. You got to put Minnesota in there too. Not, oh yeah, to Minnesota, and Kirk Cousins just doesn't throw picks. If Kirk Cousins can just manage the game. Minnesota's going to be in the hunt. I ain't put Detroit in there. Hey, they um, who was the guy we talked about last week? They got Garrett now, right? Yes. I mean, look, Matthew Stafford, he's he's not in the Aaron Rodgers or Eli Manning class yet. It's unfortunate he should be. But Matthew Stafford is one of those guys where it's like, you know, what ifs start coming in. Maybe this year, the what ifs can be answered. Because he has weapons. So, I mean, yeah, nine wins in the NFC is the equivalent to seven wins in the AFC. Like, what you want, a cookie? Almost there, buddy. Like, I'm almost okay. Only a horseshoe's a hand grenade. So, yeah, like, it doesn't surprise me because you also got to think. I think the worst division in the NFC, even though we'll get to it, is probably going to end up being. So, actually, that's the thing about the NFC. I honestly believe. Every team in the NFC has the capability, one except for Chicago. I think every team but Chicago, Tampa Bay, Washington, and Arizona has the chance to catch at least six games this year. Ooh, you said Arizona. Everybody else has a chance to win more than six games. I take he put Arizona in that category of not, of not being worth watching. 
the NFL. There's only so many. There's, there's 16 teams in each conference down there. There's literally only so hey. many wins you can get. There's a buzz around Arizona. I'm just saying. There's a buzz over there. We'll get into it in two weeks. There's a buzz over there. In no, Arizona. no. Are you, are you going to vouch for every team but Chicago and Cleveland, basically? Hey. You got to remember, they're getting their running back back now. Okay. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. Sam Bradford's there. They drafted Josh Josh Rosen. I mean, I mean, people people are looking at this rookie quarterback class, and they and to them, one of these quarterbacks is going to lead a team to a successful season. We'll get into that after we get to the West, and we we have all the everything we talked about. But that, that's something for y'all to think about. It's something for you to think about, Dallas. Yes, we got a couple more shows to do. Uh, uh, uh. It's just that's a thought. We yeah. talk about college now, and you just Jesus, you just you can't please everybody, Darnell. So why try? Hey, you can't you make mean? everybody happy. No, I'm just saying it's a thought. It's, it's what the buzz is. I'm not. You gotta, you gotta pass into the buzz around what's going on. I'm just saying there's a buzz over there. I ain't, I'm not saying they're going to do it. I just say there's a buzz. Keep buzzing, Arizona. Keep buzzing. So, we're going to recap. Right. We both got the Patriots. And pretty much everybody else in the world got the Patriots winning the division. And even though even though we didn't talk about them a lot, I think me and you are both picking Philly, right? And we both picking Philly. They brought everybody back. It's like we didn't talk about them a lot, but it's, it's for obvious reasons. Like it's what they to talk about. Everybody that came back. They got both quarterbacks. They got one quarterback who was about to be an MVP candidate who got hurt, and another one who blew out the Patriots in the Super Bowl. What they to talk about? I mean, but my hot take is the Giants and the Cowboys will be fight for a wild card spot. It's two coming out of the NFC East. Well, well, now, running back, so we'll now let's switch to some other matters. Something that I'm pretty sure Dallas has been waiting to get into. So we're going to start the college ball ranks and we're going to talk about the Atlantic Coast. As everybody remembers, it's been run by Clemson for like the last, what, three years? Pretty much. When college football is interesting thing about college football is, it's very rare when a football team in college can achieve what Alabama has achieved. I know we're not talking about the SEC, but think about how many teams in history have achieved that kind of run. I say that to say, this could be the year. This Wait. could definitely be the year. Are you saying close in national championship? No. I'm saying Clemson caught slipping. Oh. I'm saying Clemson, the coach might not get complacent. The staff might not get complacent. The quarterback might not get complacent. The thing about those senior linebackers, those senior fourth and fifth string wide receivers, that senior third string safety, that senior strong safety who's trying to smell the Kool Aid because he's a third round projected pick. Like at the end of the day, Devil Sweeney can't play the game. Devil Sweeney can't get on the field against Syracuse and right the wrong. Clemson showed last year. Ooh, wait a minute. Hold on. That ain't good. But what's that? Syracuse. Mm. And if I remember correctly, I have to look it up, right? Ladies and gentlemen, if you're a Hurricane fan, if you're a Seminole fan, he's saying this is the year Clemson gets caught. If y'all can't do it this year, I just don't know. 
I, I don't know. If this is not the year for Miami, because, I mean, Florida State, eh, I can give Florida, because in college football, more way more so than NFL football. College football, once you lose your quarterback, it's a wrap. It's done, so that's it. Bye-bye. Um, the dude they threw out there, forget, like, measurables. You could tell he was a true freshman. It just, it, you can't throw somebody into power five football as a true freshman who wasn't expecting to play. I don't care if he was stressed out. I don't care if he's on scholarship. I don't care if they didn't register him for a reason. Dude, week one, one expecting to play, quarterback goes down with an injury. Dude, let's be real. All right. So I can give Florida right. State last season, but, whew. By you, look at Miami. I must ask this question. Is the U officially back? Define back. We all remember the U. They had the swag. They had the headlines. They was making noise. Playing for championships. By you saying this is the year for Miami, are they back? Not, not at that level. If Miami were to make the playoff, I think they could beat an Oklahoma, but a Georgia, an Auburn, an Alabama, yeah, if Ohio State can can get through with all they've been going through. Oh, we'll get me. We'll get into that shortly. Dude, uh, making the playoff is a great accomplishment, especially when you're thinking of the baby step that Miami has been taking. I don't think they won a championship. I, I think that, mm, I think that Miami has what it takes to win the ACC. I think they could be Clemson straight up with all the marbles on the line in the conference championship game. I think that if Miami were to win the ACC, it would require them to have one loss or less. And if they have one loss or less and beat Clemson straight up, they should obviously get the playoff. Uh, beating, winning two games back-to-back against one of the three other teams that could legitimately win a national championship that year, yeah. That's tough, man. Look. Okay. Miami fans are like Steelers fans, Cowboys fans, and Packers fans. They're spoiled because they had so many runs of greatness. We're not talking like, oh, we got lucky in 1945, like Army, and won a national championship when nobody knew how to pass the ball. Dude, we're talking like the, the 80s, the 90s, and the early 2000s. And I mean... Not this year, okay. and not with a man named Nick Saban running around. Okay, okay, okay. He's picking the Hurricanes to come out of the ACC. Dallas, my brother. Uh-huh. I got to disagree with you. Oh. Clemson's not getting caught this year. Mm. Clemson will not be caught. I, Miami, last year, it was a great season. It was good. But all of a sudden, you still lost to Florida State. And everybody knew Florida State was having a down year. Florida State still owns you. But that lost in... in Keep you out of the conversation. You got down, you went to Pittsburgh, and you couldn't beat the Pittsburgh Panthers. You couldn't beat the Pittsburgh Panthers. Mm. What is there for me to believe? When you had your shot, and you had your chance. Mm-hmm. You got caught. 
of Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh went three and five in conference play. Five and seven overall, but one of the five wins was to Miami. Mark Wheat, you got to prove that to me this year. That was when I already proved it. Mm-hmm. He proved he can win the big ones. He mm-hmm. got to take real quick. Do you think that Mark Wick has a better team right now? Do you think he's quickly built a better program right now that can compete better than he ever had at Georgia? That's a, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. When you think about it, let's be real. Everybody knows in the SEC East, you you play Florida, you play Missouri, South Carolina shows up every now and again, but you know in the SEC East, you're not getting the real competition. The SEC West is the only division in college football to have two people playing a national championship game in the BCS era. They had two teams in the New Year's Six Bowl. Now, granted, you know, the ACC was well represented in the New Year's Six Bowl, but it goes to show, like, the SEC West, you, like, poof. Mark Rick had to have in the back of his head, I'm going to go to the SEC championship game against Auburn or Alabama. And if it's not Auburn or Alabama, that means Texas A&M or Mississippi State is having a ridiculous year, and it's just going to mud stop everybody in their way. I get Mark Rick credit. I get Mark. I get Mark Rick credit. He played at Miami. He's from Miami, so he started to bring the youth back. He brought the swag back. The turnover chain, you know. Starting to see, you starting to get in the glimpse of Miami being Miami, but that was year one. What does year two have? Yeah, and, and that's and that's think about that man. Like think about it. The way Miami was last year, it almost made you sit down and wonder, well, dang, where the hell was that at Georgia? And it's like you said, man. Like maybe Miami is one of those rare programs where an alum needs to be the head coach. Maybe a hurricane needs to leave the hurricane. Maybe Miami just one of the friends, one of them teams where it's like, if, if you want a hurricane, you really know how to teach a hurricane how to be a hurricane. Like, it, it's literally night and day. And now coming into year two, it's kind of like what I was going into. College football rarely has a team run a Power 5 conference for a very long period of time. Even Texas had their day. Even Texas had to stop their run eventually. And people forget, before Nick Saban came back, Alabama, they were going through it. So, you know, I, I'm on the side of Miami probably making some noise. I don't think that you will be all the way back this year. But I'm on the side of the fence where Miami makes noise and makes the playoff rather than Clemson can just keep it up and not be complacent. Now, allow, allow me to do my due diligence. We have a new regime at Florida State. Yeah. Does that take them down, or does that bring them up? Man, God. Now, you know, Jimbo Fisher did a great job at Florida State. Won the BCS championship. It was just one of those things where the old message is old. Yeah, man. Like, you know. It's old. So, you know, hey, 
you did everything you could do here. You had a great tenure. But we, we, we need a new voice. Yeah, man, like, you know, Florida State Seminoles are pretty much the Pittsburgh Steelers for college football. Willie Taggart is like the third coach in like the four decades. It's, it's like, you know, Florida State's going to give you the time. Now, Willie Taggart goes out and is four and five or four and six. Or, or, I don't know if they're going to give him that much time. But realistic expectations, Florida State should finish third. I'm being real realistic, like being super duper realistic, taking into account Miami, Clemson, Georgia Tech, uh, Lake Forest, Duke's been trying to do some stuff and develop over the years. Taking everything into account, Florida State should finish third. I think that Willie Taggart should A, keep his job, B, shouldn't get ran out the city, and C, should, should be respected. If he can finish third in the ACC. Now, for those who don't know, we'll tell you he came from Oregon. And Oregon had a, it was decent. I mean, Oregon, it, it's tough to rebuild when you lose a coach over and over again. But, you know, it, it was okay. It was okay. College football, we have ridiculous standards. But, you know, considering the fact that we're talking in the context of who's going to make the playoff every week. You know, it's okay in Oregon. Well, you said ridiculous standards. So let me go ahead and put this in here. We'll, we'll come back to Florida State, Miami, Clemson. But I got to throw this in here. A situation happened at the University of North Carolina. Yeah. 13 players have been suspended on the football team for selling the team. Shoes. What was the first thing that came to your head, Dallas, when you heard about this? The NCAA is a joke. It's a joke, dude. Like, first off, think about it. The team gave the kids shoes. But the team can't give walk on a free meal. So by NCAA rules, walk-ons can't eat a free meal with the team. They would have to somehow pay for it. And there is team issues here. Like, for example, if you're in practice and you walk out the building in your practice gear, it's not being given something impermissible. It's team authorized. I would imagine, in theory, that if somebody were to wear a practice jersey, take it home, and have it back by the end of the season, it wouldn't be a violation. You know, they have sweatsuits and stuff and all that. It's, what I'm basically trying to get at is the NCAA is totally ass backwards. Ass backwards. All kinds of turned around. The dude sold the shoes that were given to them by the team. Michael Jordan. Yeah. These are Jordan Brady Jews we're talking about here. Yes. So you have to think to yourself, like, these are Jordan Brady Jews from a major Division One football program. You are stunting. You are styling. You are profiling. Not to mention Michael Jordan went to UNC, so. Exactly. Exactly. You, you represent the University of North Carolina, the Queen City. I mean, you, you got a lot of great alum from that state in general that know something about expensive clothing. So when you think about it, too, when do these guys have a chance to get a job? They're doing summer conditioning. They're doing training camp. They're doing spring. Like, when do these guys have time to do anything but do a teaching or internship that's mandated? Like, these dudes, I, I didn't look it up. I'm, I'm like, hey, what class were they? How many seniors were there? Do you remember? Yeah, they were seniors. They were seniors. Yeah, 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 they
especially the quarterback. So you got so you got starters on the football team that colluded together to sell shoes. So this makes me wonder, like, okay, they're at a major program. UNC, this is not the first time that they've fallen under, fallen under violations in the athletics department. So it makes you wonder, well, dang, okay, if you had tutors for the boys and everything, but clearly they've, they've, they've tightened up. Clearly they don't want the NCAA to come down on them again okay. because they, they clearly ain't paying the dudes. Yeah, there man. is no under-the-table money at North Carolina because starters are selling shoes. Here's my thing. And it seems this is a trend. This is a trend, and for some reason, has nobody solved this trend yet. Seems like every time when college sports are coming back into play, you have this these things where students, where student athletes are in trouble for selling stuff, or getting stuff from other people, stuff like that. Hey, that's the question once again: Should these college athletes get? Hey, because I know people are asking that question. Because every time you turn around, there's, a, there's an athlete in trouble with something that involves money. Uh-huh. This is a trend. This is This is getting ridiculous. It's clear I that know if when you give when you give an athlete their clothes, is it personal property or is it still school property? So if you are selling school property, I can understand that. But if you give that to you, if you give that to that and you can take it home and they have that a violation, I can't sell it. I don't know. It, it is clear that these athletes that are on these scholarships don't have enough. And, and do just one second. Let me represent real quick. This is football we're talking about. And sometimes college basketball we're talking about. These are the revenue-making sports. Baseball is probably in third place. Other than that, dude, you're talking about 11 scholarships going across men and women. Swimming, track, cross country. We're talking like barely over 10 scholarships that's supposed to cover those programs. Track and field, there's like no money spent on track and field. Don't let the big schools fool you. And even some big schools. There's some D1 track and field facilities that are trash. We're talking about the football players here and everything, but it's a bigger issue. Dude, if the football players are selling UNC Georgia, oh, my price it is. In college, you probably don't even get how much you can sell your shoes for. If you actually finish out your college career and you're decent, and you can make a name for yourself, you don't even understand how much it'd be worth a year after you graduate. So selling it now, you're not even reaching the full value of your investment or your asset. That goes to show you, like, these dudes need the money. And if the football players need the money, this is bad at a major school. What does that tell you about track and cross country and wrestling and, and all the other sports that aren't basketball and football? You know, we, we're not going to get in, any more into it, but if you have any feedback, you can hit us up on our website. You can hit us up on Anchor. You can hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and give us your thoughts on this. But we're going to leave it right there. We're going to get back into the top half of that. Now, you pick Miami. I'm going to look at Miami's schedule. They open up the season against LSU at a neutral site. LSU ain't LSU is still a, a three plus loss team. So I'm picking them for that one. And Savannah State at Toledo. 
FIU. That's an in city rivalry. Mm-hmm. But I mean, uh, it's such, I, I know you like to play both sides of the fence, but dude, FIU doesn't have a chance. You saying FIU doesn't have a chance? You ain't be after that. Florida State comes to Miami. October 6th. Mm-hmm. So for that game. That's where, that's where that one regular season loss might come. Because <laughs> that's just enough time to where if w- Willie Taggart has the Florida State Seminoles back and cooking, that's when they should be reaching their peak. May I be able to change your mind, though? At Virginia. Virginia. At Virginia. At Boston College. You telling me one of those teams can't, can't catch Miami? I don't see Boston College getting Miami. Because what's going to happen is if they lose against Florida State, that's going to wake them back up. If they lose against Florida State, now I'll say this. I'll say this to your point. If Miami can beat, beat Florida State, then I can see them looking at that as a hump that they just got over and that it's smooth sailing. But I give – I can't figure out who I give more of an edge to, though, out of those two. To be honest with you, if it's not Florida State, I really think Georgia Tech. I look at Georgia Tech as the other team besides Florida State that could probably get them. I see the Virginia Tech. I think Virginia Tech. Mm, I see Virginia Tech. That's Virginia, Virginia Cavaliers. I'm saying Virginia Tech, November 17th, Lane Stadium, Black State Virginia. Mm. And you know it gets mm. down at West Virginia. You get down at Virginia Tech. It gets down. I don't know, man. Ugh. And then they're at home and pick the coastal season now, which I think they still gonna have that sour taste in their mouth from what happened last year. So, I don't think Pitt has a shot. I don't think Pitt has a shot. Look, the thing with me, Darnell, is I don't necessarily disagree with you. I'm just thinking to myself, like, if they lose against Florida State or Georgia Tech, I think that's what wakes them up. And that's that's a long way to go for Virginia Tech to probably be the team that does it. Because by November seventeenth, they should be they should be getting ready for Clemson. Fair point. I'm looking at I'm looking at LSU. I mean, you have to look at it. It's it's ACC versus SEC. But but but. This isn't this isn't Virginia though. I mean, what is what is what is the direction of the LSU program right now? Good question. That's a question for next week. Florida State, oh, obviously, okay. that's an in-state rivalry. Yeah, Florida State, Miami. That's one of the biggest robberies in college football. Period. I'm pretty like sure. Robbery. I'm pretty sure they get tired of hearing Florida State on in Miami. Exactly. This Miami team, if this Miami team is on the way to like truly being the U again, ain't no way they lose in Miami to Florida State this year. Uh-uh. Because DeAndre Francois, we didn't even get the chance to like really see what it would be like having a full season with DeAndre Francois. I mean, last year was supposed to be like his like legit like coming out party. I'm looking at Boston College game. And I'm looking at the Virginia Tech game. Those are four games I'm looking at for Miami. LSU, Florida State, Boston College, Virginia Tech. When you have an FCS team, when you have a power of five team that can make the triple option work, is Army, Navy, and Air Force and Georgia State can't necessarily get it done with the option because they just don't have the personnel. And they still play power five teams respectively. 
But Georgia Tech, when I think of Miami, like, that's, that's probably the way to upset them. You've got to eat the clock. You've got to keep the ball away. You have to wear down their defense and show them that you ain't no punk. That's, that's the... <sighs> I agree with you. I, I agree with you. The thing is, I think the teams in the ACC, they don't see it so much, and they know Georgia Tech, and it's like, we know what you want to do. Yeah. So, so the thing and is, for, the and the thing is for us, it's like, if we can put up points, that puts that your option at a disadvantage. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Georgia Tech, you know that they want to run for 450 yards. You're going to have to make them pass the ball. And the only way that you truly make a triple option team pass the ball is to be up 21. And, and I think all know the days of Stephen Hill and Calvin Johnson, they ain't got a wide receiver that can save them. Now, if Georgia Tech comes in with a defense, then I'm with you. Well, if you don't have a defense to go on the other side of that triple option offense, who cares? Yeah, so I mean, yeah, 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 y'all took eight minutes off the clock and scored a touchdown, but guess what? We just took two minutes and we just scored right back. Yep. And. When you talk about an upset, that's literally what's going to have to happen. It, it has to be Georgia Tech gets the kickoff, takes nine minutes to score, Miami kicks a field goal. Georgia Tech scores. Like, Georgia Tech is going to have to get touchdown. Like, they have to get touchdown. Because if they kick a field goal, then score a touchdown, Miami can still tie up the game or take the lead in, like, three minutes. It, it, you, it, but that's the thing with the triple option. The triple option, once you get to the red zone, it, it, you run out of space. So, uh, but that, that's always been the dreaded. That, that's the weird thing. We talk about ridiculous standards, and we talk about who's going to make the playoffs and stuff like that. In the BCS era, going to Tech, like, you know, getting a New Year's Six Bowl, it would have been, oh, well, you know, uh, it's politics, it's Nick Saban, it's Mark Rick, it's Georgia, it's Ohio State. Uh, oh, what you going to do uh, is politics. Uh, you can't do that now. Because what the playoff has basically done is if you win the ACC, you're going to make the playoff. So you're not doing all that you can to win the ACC. Then what are you doing? Well. Uh, show picking the Miami Hurricanes. Let's go to my pick, the Clemson Tigers schedule. Foreman, that's an easy, you know, 70 to nothing victory. Week 2, September 8th, at Texas A&M, Jimbo Fisher, error. And they got back to back, to back weeks with what we just talked about, the triple option team, Georgia State, Georgia Tech. Home to Syracuse at Wake Forest. NC State comes in. Sucker that game. NC sucker that game. NC State. Sucker that game. At Florida State, sucker mm-hmm. that one. Louisville comes into Death Valley at Boston College. Home to Duke and home to the South Carolina Gamecocks. Yeah, this is A&M. Jimbo Fisher era. That's another ACC SEC match. You talking about the twelfth? The twelfth at Texas A and M. That's a loud stadium. You drop down to October October twentieth, NC State. They caught they caught Clemson before at home. They called him before at Death Valley. At Florida State. Yeah. What kind of team would they be by that time? 
Yeah. Home to Louisville. How would they look around that time without Lamar Jackson? And that's, oh, I, I know that we have to do our fair no shake of everything to be objective, but God, poor Louisville. They're going to have a rough year. So you're saying, without Lamar Jackson, that is it. Both uh, it's a down year. Don't even consider them. Yeah, man. I know, that was college football. And they can always have a quarterback show up this year. Red shirt, whatever. Um, true sophomore. They can always have a quarterback show up this year, but I mean, ain't no Baker Mayfield this year. I really know. At Boston College, yeah. we already said about Miami. Going to Boston College, that's always a tricky game. And then you finish the season off with your in-state rivalry with the South Carolina Gamecocks. Yeah. You think South Carolina spoiled something? Not in Death Valley. Not in Death Valley. Mm. So there was a way you could give South Carolina the shot. Yeah, I give them a shot. It is in Death Valley. One thing I know about Dallas Sweeney, he's going to tell the scene, don't, don't, don't you look ahead in that conference championship game. You better realize who we playing. We're playing South Carolina. We're playing the SEC team. Yeah, he can tell them as much as he wants. The difference between a, a Dabo Sweeney and Nick Saban is Nick Saban is Alabama. Like, it doesn't matter if you got them to the national championship and y'all were still in the game. And going into halftime. If you're not going to win that game, we'll bench you. If you're not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are a five star recruit and you committed to Alabama at the last second because of Nick Saban's recruiting. If there's a one star or a Juco transfer that's better than you, you will be on the bench. You want to transfer? Okay. He'll block you and make sure you never play in the SEC again. Nick Saban is Alabama. So I could understand that. But Dabo Sweeney, I'm not saying he's not a great coach. I'm not saying he's a leader of men. It's just I don't know, man. Ugh. No, I'm not saying oh I'm not saying oh South Carolina I'm not saying that. It's just when you think of like the whole scope of what we're talking about here. Like ugh. Well, all right, just to recap, Dallas is picking the Hurricanes to come out of the ACC. I'm going with the reigning champs of the ACC, the Clemson Tigers. So this was Gears Hill. Let's get to our last topic of the day. We're going to the Big Ten. And, oh, how Dallas has been waiting on this one. We're talking the Big Ten and... The Big Ten is looking like at the beginning Ohio State was supposed to run the conference. But some things happened. Some things happened with Urban Myers. The situation with the former assistant coach and the mess advisor with his wife. Urban Myers is now on a measure of pay lead as the independent Investigate this matter, which they say it should include within 14 days. <sighs> now, before I get into how I feel about the Big Ten, Dallas, I'm going to give you the floor and say what you need to say about this whole Overmire situation. Well, the chest don't start catching pain. Well, that's the situation. Uh, controversial situation. Coincidentally, the same kind of, not the exact same kind of situation, but kind of the same climate when he left Florida and retired from coaching. It's, you know, I don't see how your wife knew. I don't see how wives of the entire coaching staff do. I don't see how a journalist who's not even employed by ESPN anymore can break the story on his Facebook with receipts and text messages 
and everybody knows but you. You, you're in the same conference as one of the worst college football scandals in history. We're in an era of really making sure that our women are protected and making sure that we can quell domestic violence as much as possible. And you didn't know. I'm just trying to figure out how you're the great Urban Meyer. You won national championships at Florida. You won a national championship at Ohio State. You made Bowling Green somewhat relevant when you were there. It made Utah relevant. I'm just trying to figure out how you're the great Urban Meyer. And this assistant was that important. You're the one getting paid millions of dollars. You're the one that people are interviewing. You're the one that people are giving credit to. You're the one that people are putting the blame on. What was so special about this assistant where you would let all this happen and you would let it come to this? What? It's not even about football on the field anymore. Because as a, as a man, much less a football coach, you can't, it couldn't be me. You walk in, tell me to, do this, do that, go to class, be respectable, don't smoke, uh, don't sell memorabilia, uh, curfews at 10.30. You can't give, I'm, I'm 21, I'm 22, I'm 20. you can't give me a curfew, and you sitting here basically not telling, letting something like this go down, if you want to tell me to go to bed early, like, who are you? How, how can you lead a team like that? We're in an era of social media and transparency. It, we have to talk about the sports side because it's, it's a head coach. And it's not like he's sick, legit sick. It's not like, you know, some personal stuff happened. Like, dude, you're in the middle of a scandal. And you're trying to get out of Dodge. That's all you try to do. You try to get out of Dodge. You are paid administrative leave. That basically means to leave, get some of the heat off of us. We're trying to enroll people. We're trying to get rose scholars. We're trying to recruit athletes. We're trying to give me a mess in the money up urban here. Go somewhere. That's what I got from paid administrative leave. I don't really, I don't really know what to say. I wish, I wish that, you know, coaches would be held to the same amount of accountability as students. If this was a, if this was a football player, He'd probably either be detained right now or he would have been dismissed indefinitely, whether he did it or not. And you know what? As he should be. Because either way, man, you got to be smarter and stop putting yourself in situations whether you did it or not, when this can happen. Because in the NFL, all it takes is one mistake and nobody's going to believe. Because then you're a blue check celebrity. But, but you, can't, you can't tell a college kid that you're going to pay millions of dollars, and you're trying to protect somebody who's your assistant. You're going to pay the millions, millions and millions of dollars. You can write off in the sunset. He's mad at you for firing him? So? I think it's the phone. Change your number. I, I don't really know what else to like to know about it. It's just it's disappointing. And as a coach myself, it's just it's hypocritical. And that's the thing that sucks the most about it. It's super hypocritical. We got 13 kids going down to get suspended for selling shoes because they clearly needed the money. But Urban Meyer's on paid administrative leave. And this woman could have died. And they could have did everything in the world to stop it. All right. As you see, we're going to cap it right there. So we're going to get into the football side of it. Before this came out about Urban Myers, the coaches poll came out, and Ohio State was ranked third behind Clemson. Alabama. Wisconsin was the second big team, but they was ranked seven behind. They was ranked seven with Penn State ranked ninth. But CBS came out with their poll, their rankings, and they have Ohio State fourth with Wisconsin fifth, Penn State eighth, and Michigan State at tenth. So you clearly can see that CBS factored in the whole Urban Meyer situation in, in their rankings. And the coaches for the day, that's before the Urban Meyer thing came out. 
Now we'll see what the AP poll comes out. It should be coming out soon. We'll see what Ohio State and Wisconsin are ranked at. But Dallas, mm-hmm. are you rolling with ESPN and saying that Ohio State is is on top of the conference? I mean, I feel like this is a yes or no question, but I just, I can't just simply say a one-word answer. It's just it's weird, man. I would, I would sincerely hope that if Urban Meyer was going to do all this for one of his assistants and his interim coach can keep the ball rolling. You know what? I think, I think more so out of spite than anything. I'll play the Ohio State in the preseason simply because I can't believe this man would draw this to keep an assistant coach and his interim coach ain't ready to step up and at least keep the ball rolling. He ain't fired yet. Which means that either he can come back in the middle of the season or, you know, he'll just go to the beach this year. Either way, until Urban Meyer is fired, all this dude has to do is keep the ball rolling. He just needs to keep the train going. So, I'll stick with Ohio State just because I hope the program doesn't fall down because for the one dude, that brings an even bigger issue with college sports that we got to address. But, you know, I'll stick with Ohio State. You stick with Ohio State. All right, before I make my pick, I'm going to go through some of these teams and go through their schedule. Let's start with your pick, Ohio State. They'll open up the season September 1st at home against Oregon State. Big 10, Pac-12 matchup. Do we really think Oregon State has a chance? No. And they're at home against workers. I mean, that pretty much sells it up right there. And then we get to the good one. September 15th, neutral site versus TCU. That's a huge game for TCU more than it is Ohio State. I think Ohio State loses that game. It could be written off as a good loss. It could be written off as Urban Meyer was having some issues. It could be written off as, you know, they just, the, the, the toils of the season is getting to them. They can lose that game, though. TCU, however, they got to win it. They have to win that game. A, because if they can't be Ohio State, they can't be Oklahoma. C, because if they do end up losing against Oklahoma, then they, now we're talking, are you going to make a New Year's Six Bowl? they got to win that game. Okay. Then you have Tulane coming in. Okay. So essentially they can be 4-0, and 3-1. and one. By the time they get into the conference mm-hmm. play at Penn State. That's real interesting. Because if they lose to TCU, people will basically do what I just said. But if they do lose to TCU, that means they got to win out. Then State, we're talking about a team that's won the Big Ten once within the last four years. They've, they've been the top of them out. They know what it takes to get it done. James Franklin's been doing the work. So, I mean, you think they win that game? At, at Penn State, it's hard to say. I think I like Penn State in that one. I got to go with Penn State on that one. Then they come home to play Indiana, Minnesota, mm-hmm. on the road to Purdue. Home to Nebraska with new head coach Scott Frost. What could Scott Frost do with a power five team if he did what he did with UCF? Yeah. Yeah. Now I get it. I understand. He went home. Who doesn't want to go home to help? So 
So I understand he he wanted to go home. He wanted to help his program. But can you have that same center or can you have that same center that you had at UCF? In theory, you would hope it somehow be better. You can't be too much better than thirteen and zero, but you can be thirteen and zero with a chip. I mean, UCF was like, were they winless or were they one and eleven the year before? Two two years before, they was they went winless. Then Scott Foster's first year, they went six and six, and then last year they had the unbeaten season. So think about two year turnaround, power five teams, you beat Auburn and New York State or Peach Bowl, I believe. Now, in theory, you go from winless group of five teams to undefeated and beat an SEC team in a major bowl game. You would think that with a power five team, power five recruiting, power five money, she'd be able to make some noise. Now, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to put the same pressure on him that I would put, say, a Todd Bowles in the NFL or a whoever's coaching the Chargers at this point. I'm not going to put that kind of pressure on him first year there. What I am saying is, dude, Ohio State being a turmoil like this, Jim Harbaugh, Getting ready to get out of that honeymoon phase. Michigan State and Wisconsin never being able to do it when it matters. I would be in the exact same way. You, if you, if you don't do it this year, what year are you really going to do it with Nebraska? I mean, you even got Northwestern every once in a while winning that game. And speaking of Michigan State. They're at Michigan State in the week after Nebraska. Mm-hmm. We know how those games go. At Maryland, and then they finish it out at home in a horseshoe against the Wolverines. This season could go okay, really so well. Let's, 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 let's like context the discussion before we go anymore. Who are the three teams that could win if Ohio State, if this is, if this is just too much for Ohio State? If Ohio State loses to Penn State and TCU, a two-loss ACC team ain't going to get into the uh, playoffs. So who are the three teams that could win the conference and have a chance to get into the playoffs? Penn State. If Ohio State could win. Penn State, all right. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. And either one of the Michigan teams. Hmm. Uh, uh, if Penn State didn't get in the year they won, I don't think Michigan State gets there. Because it's a level of – the college football playoff has shown when they snubbed Penn State and when they let Alabama get in after losing their division. The college football committee showed that they'll take reputation over performance. I don't know if Michigan State wins to get split off. Michigan is one of those names. Michigan State has been in the playoffs. It just so happened there was one of the two teams out of the Big Ten who got shut out. That's the highest they being the other team who got shut out. I forgot. That's why I forgot. So was that Cousins last year or was that Connor Cook last year? I think that was – I think that might have been Cousins last year. Obviously. That was the 2014 playoff? I believe so. Okay, hold on. Let me do it. So that could have been Connor Cook last year. I'm thinking Connor Cook. So I'm saying Wisconsin, Penn State, Michigan State, Michigan. That's why Ohio State can't do it. Hmm. And speaking of which, let me go to Michigan State schedule. All right, so Michigan State opens up at home against Utah State. That's what that's one of your group mm-hmm. of five, one of your group of five teams out of the Mountain West that you're looking at. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, at Arizona, Herman Edwards. It's back at it's back coaching. He's at Arizona State. Sure, 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 sure. At Indiana. Mm-hmm. Home to Central Michigan. Home to Northwestern. Mm-hmm. At Penn State. Home to Michigan. Mm-hmm. Home to Purdue. Mm-hmm. At Maryland. Mm-hmm. Home to Ohio State. Mm-hmm. At Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Home to workers. So pretty much outside of Penn State, Arizona State, and possibly Nebraska, most of their big games are at home. So if Michigan State survives this schedule, they have a shot to get it in. It's a strong enough schedule. I see more than one loss on it. That's the issue. They ain't walking out of that with one and one loss. Shoot, I could see them losing to Arizona State. Because Arizona State wasn't a bad team the past couple years. And Nebraska, you know, Michigan State is one of those teams when Nebraska, that's, that's a win that Fox can get. That's one of those this is a new era win that Frost can get. I see more than two losses. I definitely see more than one. And like I said, a two-loss ACC champion ain't getting into the playoff. So if we can see more than one loss, then eh. So you're saying a two-loss shit team doesn't get in either? Yeah. Okay. Sticking so we're going to be talking probably... So we're going to be talking probably one Pac-12, one Big 12, two SEC. Mm. But again, like, you know, Clemson repeat. I think they repeat either undefeated in the regular season or with with only one loss in the regular season. So all I know is, yeah, man. Between those two conferences, it's, uh... We're going to stay uh, in the state of Michigan. We're going to go to the Michigan side. Okay. They open up. Now, here's the weird thing. Now, the weird thing about Michigan is... Ohio State, Fred. Michigan State, power. Wisconsin, power. Northwestern, just good coaching. Ball control. Get it done. Indiana, Dauber. Iowa. Baller, uh, Rutgers, Jobber, Michigan. What 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 do they do? What is their identity? Jim, Jim, how many years of Jim Harbaugh? We don't even know really what they're good at. That's Jim Harbaugh. But let me go ahead. They open up at Notre Dame, and ESPN said the first college game day will be on site. South End for Michigan Notre Dame. That's the, the game of the week. Opening week. So you already coming out with the game of the week. Okay. They at home for the next three games. Western Michigan. SMU. Nebraska. Uh-huh. At Northwestern, home to Maryland, home to Wisconsin. Uh-huh. At Michigan State, home to Penn State. At Rutgers, home to Indiana, and finish it off at the Horseshoe against Ohio State. Uh-huh. Now, 
now in the pre in the pre show, you said week one is the season for for Michigan. Do you still feel that way? Most definitely. Because if they if they get caught by Notre Dame, they're gonna win out. My thing isn't necessarily, oh, wow, Michigan lost to Notre Dame. But, uh, I get it. It's Notre Dame. Notre Dame is like the most powerful independent. Army ain't there yet. BYU is garbage. Notre Dame is like the number one of the independent. So you're basically going to lose against Notre Dame, who's Notre Dame and has the track record. And is the number one independent team coming in. It's a good loss. But. When you lose that game week one, you're basically playing with your back against the wall the entire season. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what sport it is. If you're playing with your back against the wall the entire season, you're going to be playing scared. You're going to be too worried about doing what you have to do to not lose instead of winning. Yeah, they lose that game. That's that's a wrap. Because, again, what has Michigan done? I feel kind of differently. They lose the week. One. They lose week one. They got three straight home games, so they can bounce back very quickly. But Darnell, that's that's all well and good. Are they are they going to win out? That's the question. What I'm saying is they can lose week one, but they have the schedule to make a noise. But but I'm not talking about making noise. You can make noise with two losses. You can make noise, be 10-2, and two, and then come back the next year ready to ball out. But are they going to win out if they lose against Notre Dame? I don't believe so. But, yeah, that's – if Urban Meyer either gets fired or in an indefinitely or this really takes a toll and the boys go rogue in the locker room, I think the Big 12 is washed out. I don't think a Big 12 team makes the playoff this year. That's not to say that the Big Ten champ. I mean, yeah, Big Ten, my bad. That's not to say that the Big Ten champion doesn't make a New Year's Six Bowl. That's not to say that the Big Ten champion doesn't still show that, hey, you know, highest that being 2020, we're one of the four best teams we should have gotten in, even with two losses. But, you know. I see your point. I see your point about them winning up, because. They're not surviving Wisconsin at Michigan State and Penn State. They're not surviving that stretch. And, I mean, you know, I, I wish just for, like, comparison's sake, we could throw in Notre Dame. Because, I mean, like, like the Army, UMass, EYU, love them, but – they ain't got a shot in a dark hill. So when you think about Notre Dame, they're literally the only independent that has an outside shot to make the playoff. But the weird thing about Notre Dame is they got to go undefeated. And their schedule is blah. Their schedule is about the, the worst you can get without playing Alabama every week. So the bad thing about Michigan is they lose that game. It's going to be a great loss because Notre Dame might finish 9-3, and 10-2. and two. Notre Dame is going to finish with 9 or more wins, and they're going to look at their schedule, and they're going to be, God, God, Notre Dame went through a conflict. I mean, can we really blame Michigan? Notre Dame was ready to play this season. It won't matter. But you're not buying it. Uh-uh. All right, now let's go to the two teams that I'm actually looking at in the Big Ten, starting with Penn State. Penn State schedule looks at this. Appalachian State. At Pitt, they go your Big Ten ACC matchup. Mm -hmm. Kent State. At Illinois, home to Ohio State, home to Michigan State. At, they're at Indiana, home to Iowa, at Michigan, home to Wisconsin, at Workers. They finish it off home against Maryland. Yeah, I 
Do I say any state conference championship game? Oh, I think that Penn State. Hold on, I should, I should see the division. I need to see the division because I think that Penn State, if they're not in the same division as Wisconsin or Michigan, Penn State they definitely make it. Penn State is in the division with Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State. Jesus. Well. <sighs> So do I so do I say oh, West Conference in the Big Ten Championship game? But now you're looking at this schedule yet? Mm. So so far, the first the first team schedule we looked at was Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan State, and Michigan. One of them can only go to the only one of them can go to the conference championship. Ain't quite there yet, but that might be the second hardest conference division in all college football. That's, that's up there with the SEC West. That is a tough one. You like Ohio State. You like Ohio State. And the Big Ten overall. The Big Ten overall. But dare I say. Yeah. But dare I say. Penn State gets to the conference championship. <laughs> Let's, let's look at it. They have Ohio State at home. They have Michigan State at home. They have Iowa at home. They have Wisconsin at home. So the only two road games you're looking at at Pitt at Michigan. Okay, so we we've been talking about the East division the entire time. We both probably feel that the size was talking. Think about, you know, the four teams we've been talking about, those are the ones that we're looking at, the size was talking. Also is that the same Penn State or Michigan or even Michigan State. Any day can get to the college championship game. I don't think Northwestern is ready to win a game that big yet. I don't think Northwestern is ready to win a straight up Big Ten championship. But if they're playing, if Penn State or Michigan is playing Iowa or Wisconsin, who wins that game? I like Wisconsin. Yeah, out of Wisconsin, Iowa, Penn State, Michigan. If those are the four things I have to shoot from, it's, it's, it's Wisconsin, for better or worse, has figured out how to keep getting coaches. They're like, they're like Georgia Tech. They keep getting coaches that buy into that lunch pail philosophy. It's not pretty. It's not technical. We line up. We block. We run. Dives, we run slams, we run Izzo. We don't, we don't run off tackle. If we run off tackle, we hug the tackle on the way to the end zone. Like they, between the tackles, running. Play action every so often just to keep the cornerbacks on it. Because you don't want it to get to the point where they're doing quarterback with it. And I mean, it's, for better or worse, Wisconsin, you know what they're going to do every game. And they're doing it out of an eye formation. No, no misdirection. No trickery. No, straight up between the tackles the entire game. All right, before you go any further, let's, 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 let's run through their schedule. Yeah, they open up the three straight home games: West Kentucky, New Mexico, BYU. They go that. They go your yeah. BYU. They go your BYU team right there. Yeah, independent team, Rage, oof, Jesus, God bless me. At Iowa. Sucker that game. Mm-hmm. Home to Nebraska. At Michigan. Sucker that game. Home to Illinois. At Northwestern. Home to Rutgers. At Penn State. Sucker that game. 
at Purdue on the Minnesota. I'm gonna sit here and tell you, Wisconsin Penn State rematch for all the marbles in the Big Ten. Despite whatever happens with Ohio State, I'm taking Penn State. I'm taking Wisconsin. Y'all go at it again. Winner wins the Big Ten. It's here it's weird, man. Like, you know when I think of college football, it's consistency. Believe it or not, the team that can go out and do what they want to do every week, no matter how much a team tries to stop it, the team where you know that, okay, Alabama is going to play tough. Florida is going to do the triple option. Army is going to do the triple option. Wisconsin is going to do the power I. USC is going to throw it. Uh, you know, with another team like you know what they're going to do. Um, you you get the point. When you when you're one of those co- one one of those programs where people know what you're going to do and you can still do it. That in college football, when you're a program that should be able to take advantage of an Ohio State situation. I think solely because we know what we're going to get from Wisconsin, even if Wisconsin's having a down year, they're still going to be Wisconsin. I think because of that, because they know their identity, and I picked them over Iowa straight up. Because Iowa was the same way. If I picked Wisconsin over Iowa straight up. So it's like, if Ohio State, if it becomes too much, I'm I'm straight up with Wisconsin simply because I know what Wisconsin's going to do this year. I know what kind of program Wisconsin is. I know that if I turn on a Wisconsin game while I'm out at a sports bar or a restaurant, I'm going to see I form. I'm going to see linebackers racking up somebody. And I'm going to see decent pass defense. Not great, but decent. I'm going to see more than enough to win a game. There you have it. That's all, that's all the time we have for today. We got into a lot of stuff today. Feel free to chime in back at us. If you're on Anchor Podcast, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you hear us at, reply back to us. You can get us an email. You can email us at theplaymakersblog at gmail.com. You can get us at our website, our Facebook page, our Twitter page. That's all the time we have. That is what you got left for tomorrow. Well, you know, May Young Classic started taping today. So, you know, that's going to be fun to talk about. I actually, for once, get a chance to talk about, like, actual indie wrestling. But I get to sit within the confines of WWE. That makes me really, really happy to give some background stories on some of the people from the American Independent and Japanese Independent scene. Uh, we're going to talk about Paul Hayden's segment with Renee Young, how good that was and how this is the first time we've really seen Paul Heyman this distraught. And we're going to talk about the, the New Day. The New Day getting the win and going to face the Bludgeon Brothers at SummerSlam. We're going to see how we both feel about that and, yeah, you know, I don't know if it's going to be a marathon like it was today, but I uh, hope it will be good. We will take our time and go into everything. So, please make sure you turn into that one. All right. Until tomorrow. All right.